going to say a word, a very quick word, about something you all know, that is to say about the, the European history of Ukraine. And then I will try to develop an argument about how the European history of Ukraine mattered as the national way of seeing the world came to be prominent, and then say a word about how the European history of Ukraine matters as Europe itself becomes the way that we think about the past. So it's controversial where I come from, but you all know that Ukraine has a European history. Uh, in fact, it's a very typical European history. The beginnings of Ukrainian history or the beginnings of Kiev and Rus in a confrontation between Vikings and local peoples. This is central to the history of France. It's central to the history of Great Britain. These are central European themes. The next stage in the history of Kiev and Rus the confrontation between Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity, the various bargains, the various betrayals uh, that were made in Kiev, as in Warsaw, as in Prague, as in Bulgaria, as East European leaders oscillated between Rome uh, and, uh, and Byzantium, trying to find the best possible bargain. This is also a very typical European story. After the end of Rus, the history of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which is, I think, the, the step in Ukrainian history which is most often forgotten. It's forgotten in Lithuania, it's forgotten in the West, is a very interesting stage because it is in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania that the Kievan inheritance is preserved. The Kievan language, the language of state, also the Kievan law code. These things are preserved precisely in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The next stage in the European history of Ukraine is of course the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth after 1569, after the Union of Lublin. The Union of Lublin is a very important moment because it draws a line between what is now Belarus and what is now Ukraine for the first time in history. Uh, Ukrainian territories fall into the Polish crown, the rest falls into the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And it is during this period, the period of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, that the history of Ukraine is, so to say, most recognizably European. This is the period when we see a Renaissance, a Reformation, a Counter-Reformation, all of these nice things. It's a period when we see a Republic, the specialty of Polish history at this moment is that Polish history recreates all the things that it didn't really have. So Polish history has a renaissance, but it didn't ever have a naissance, right? There is a renaissance, but there was no there's no classical history in Poland, but there is a renaissance, all the same. And Ukraine takes part in that renaissance. Uh, Poland calls itself a republic. It has no ancient republic traditions, but it refers to them all the same. Ukraine is part of that republic. But within that republic, we have a very important tension, and a tension which is worth recalling, I think, today. The tension is between the, the very few Ukrainians, the, the, the magnates, the great aristocrats, the magnateria, who uh, did extremely well in this republic, and the vast majority of the population that, that did not. Uh, and so the rebellion, which, which is against the, the, actually the rulers of Ukraine, um, w the rebellion against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is in fact against the rulers of, 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 of Ukraine, is a rebellion against inequality. It's a rebellion um, on behalf of people who are excluded from the system, people who call themselves Cossacks. It's a very important moment in Ukraine's European history. Uh, but it's also the moment when a certain stage of that history breaks down. Because as you all know, the Cossacks find themselves in alliance with Muscovy. Um, the Cossacks then find themselves under Muscovy. And after 1667, this city uh, and all of um, 
all of right bank Ukraine, finds itself under Muscovy than under the Russian Empire. It's a very important turning point because from 1667 onwards until, let's say, about two decades ago, the elites from this city primarily moved, for, moved northwards to, to, to Moscow. Now, that is a very short sketch of a certain history. In the 19th century, all Europeans, not just Ukrainians or Poles or Russians, but all Europeans had to remake their history in a national form. That was the dominant spirit, the dominant ethos of the day. Everyone had a complicated history which was reshaped, remade, reconstructed, um, as Constantine was nice enough to refer to my book, reconstructed as, as, as a new sort of history, as a national sort of history. And here too, it's striking how typical Ukraine is. Um, the, the move to romanticism, to populism that begins in Kharkiv, which spreads to Kiev and then to Lviv, Lviv is actually at the end of this and not at the beginning, is very typically European. The idea that you have to move history away from the elites and in Eastern Europe, away from the state and towards the people and their language and their stories and their songs is quintessentially European. Um, it's something which is absolutely typically European. It begins in Germany, it spreads, it spreads elsewhere. Now, what's worth noticing here, and this is a crucial moment too, is that Ukrainian romanticism, Ukrainian populism, the move in Ukrainian history to put the people at the center of the story is primarily against the, the history of the Commonwealth. It's primarily against Poles, or Poles identified, as, as Shevchenko put it, as the, as the aristocrats and the priests. Populism is directed against the Western neighbor, um, and thus in some sense against, against Europe. And this is a very important tendency uh, to, to, watch, to watch play out. Uh, in other words, Ukrainian patriots, or people who were identifying with the Ukrainian-speaking population, always had at least two problems. They had the problem of the Russian Empire and they had the problem of Poland. And from the point of view of the 18th and 19th century, you could make an argument about which of these was Europe, right? You can certainly make an argument that St. Petersburg was Europe. You could also make an argument that Warsaw was Europe. Um, but in both cases, they seem to be a problem. And this is a development which we're going to watch. Okay, so these tensions, the multiple problems that Ukrainian patriots faced, the multiple problems um, that, that Ukrainian state builders faced become apparent in 1914. 1914 is a moment where I would say things start to become very unusual. Thus far, I've emphasized how typically European Ukrainian history is. In 1914, something unusual happens. The First World War in Eastern Europe, and now I'm going to lose all of my Polish and Czech and Romanian friends. Um, the First World War in Eastern Europe is generally a moment when you do nothing for statehood, but you get it anyway, right? Um, there, there, there went my chance to write, you know, the Polish history textbooks. But in general, there's, no, there's very little connection between how hard you fight for national independence and whether you get national independence, right? So Romania you know, does very little in the First World War, but it gets, much, it gets a lot of territory. Czechoslovakia, right? The Czechs and the Slovaks are fighting on the wrong side, but they get an entirely new state. The Polish, the Polish movement for independence exists, but it's very minor. Um, and nevertheless, an entirely new Polish state is created. And so on and so on, right? In general, you don't have to do very much. Serbia started the war. The war was Serbia's fault. Um, and yet, Serbia ends the war as the central part of a much bigger state, Yugoslavia. So, the, but the Ukrainian case here is atypical. After the war, many Ukrainians do fight 
for independence. There are two major efforts to create a Ukrainian state, one based in Kiev, one based in, in Galicia. All of, you, all of you already know this. There, there are a huge number of casualties um, on the part of people fighting for Ukrainian independence. Um, Kiev eastward and then all the way back to Warsaw, in fact. I mean, as you probably know, there are a good number of Ukrainian soldiers buried in Polish military cemeteries in Warsaw because they were fighting all the way back to, to Warsaw in August of 1919. Um, so here you have this unusual situation. You have a lot of conflict, a lot of people who are, who are dying to create a state, but at the end of it, no state. At the end of it, the failure to create a state. Um, the failure to create a state because the Russian whites are against this because um, the Poles only support it very late and within certain boundaries, but ultimately because it's the Red Army that wins um, this very complicated civil war. Now, this brings me to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet period in Ukrainian history is extremely interesting. Um, it's extremely interesting because the victory of the Red Army the creation of the Soviet Union casts the question of Ukraine and Europe in an entirely new way. Because after all, the Soviet Union, and there are many things to say about the Soviet Union, I'm just gonna focus on one aspect here. The Soviet Union was, among many other things, an attempt to recreate Europe. The premise of the Soviet Union was, we are a backward country, we need to recreate capitalism, that is to say, Europe, in order to surpass it later on, right? That is the premise of the Soviet Union. The second premise of the Soviet Union is that nations exist, although maybe not forever. So the Soviet Union is established as a state which is going to try to create something that looks like capitalism in order to go past capitalism and as something which has interior national boundaries in order eventually to transcend them, to go beyond them. So a Ukrainian republic is created inside the Soviet Union. Now, I know it's easy to dismiss this reality. It's easy to say the Soviet Union was just very repressive. And of course it was, and I, I've written about that. But there's, there's something here to be understood that we have to understand before we get to the end of the story. And that is the way that Europe uh, was both a model and an enemy at the same time in the Soviet Union, and the way that this was most intense in the case of Ukraine. Europe is a model because the entire Soviet Union has to catch up to Europe, but it's also an enemy because it's capitalist. And this ambivalence is most intense in Ukraine because Ukraine is, of course, the Western frontier of the Soviet Union. It's the big republic which has a long border with Poland and Romania, therefore, therefore with Europe. So in the 1920s, in this very interesting period of affirmative action for Ukrainians within the Soviet Union, of the, of the subsidiza subsidization of Ukrainian culture, of the support of Ukrainian modernism and futurism, you see um, this tension be resolved. Because yes, a new generation of Ukrainian writers and artists and even historians grows up within the Soviet Union, um, making very interesting art, writing very good novels, um, carrying out very good scholarship. But they are generally pro-European. And now this is a story that you know. Somewhere around 1928, 1929, 1930, um, it's no longer all right to be in favor of Europe. Um, it's especially after January of 1930, when collectivization begins in earnest and peasants resist collectivization in Soviet Ukraine massively. From that point forward, something turns. Europe is no longer seen as a model. It's no longer acceptable to be pro-European. Um, instead, all of the problems of collectivization, including the famine, are now blamed on Europe. I don't know how closely the rest of you have read this propaganda. I've spent a long time with it. The idea is, is expressed that the famine in Ukraine is the fault of Poland because Polish agents are paying Ukrainian nationalists inside the Ukrainian Communist Party and so on. And then at a slightly later stage, 
after the famine has happened, um, the, the, the discussions of the famine are blamed on Nazi Germany. So uh, the, if you mention that there was a famine in Soviet Ukraine, this means, according to, to Soviet propaganda, that you were an agent of Nazi Germany. Now, this is, a, this is a very interesting moment, of course. I mean, it's a horrible moment. It's a terrible moment. But it's an interesting moment for our story of Europe and European futures. Because it's at this moment that the, the dichotomy, the Manichaean absolute opposition between fascism and anti-fascism is created. Where uh, anti-fascism means, OK. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we have no external colonies. I quote Comrade Stalin, there, unlike the Western powers, we have no external colonies, therefore we must colonize ourselves, which means very precisely exploiting the peasants and exploiting the lands. That's one model of colonization. A second model of colonization comes from Nazi Germany. The idea of Lebensraum, the idea of living space that we all know, um, has a precise geography. The precise geography of Lebensraum is Ukraine. Like Stalin, Hitler understood Ukraine as a breadbasket. He understood it as a place that could feed an entire continent. The question was just which continent that was going to be. Um, whereas Stalin presented Ukraine as the territory that must be controlled if the Soviet Union was going to survive the world capitalist conspiracy, Hitler presented Ukraine as the territory which must be controlled if Germany was going to survive the world Jewish conspiracy. So in both cases, there is a regional colony which has to be mastered, which has to be controlled in the service of a slightly lunatic but very coherent ideology about the way the world actually works. Or to put it in, in more technical terms, there was a territory which had to be controlled if you wanted to be a world power, whether you were in Berlin or whether you were in Moscow. Now, the, 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 the Germans looked at collective farming and they saw it as a positive model. Uh, the German planners assumed that they were going to keep the collective farms in Ukraine as a means of controlling the population and of controlling the food supply. Their idea was that they would extract the food from Ukraine and use it to feed Germany and Western Europe and along the way starve 30 million Soviet citizens to death in the winter of 1941. They never starved that, that many people, but the, the intention gives you a sense of, of, of what they intended to do once they, if they could control the Western Soviet Union. So here we see a kind of extreme. We see Ukraine at the middle of unmistakably European projects at a time when perhaps Europe uh, deserved its good name less than it does today, right? This is a very different Europe. But these were unmistakably European projects that put Ukraine in the middle. Um, Ukraine was in the middle of two rival European projects based on global ideologies aiming for world power. Now, just exactly how this plays out in practice is the subject of, of, of my book, Bloodlands, which Konstantin was kind enough to mention. But the general outcome, you all know, between 1933 and 1945, there was no more dangerous place in the world than Ukraine. More people were killed as a result of policy in Ukraine than anywhere else in the world between 1933 and 1945. Now, I won't tell that whole story, but within that story of Soviet power, German power, rivalry, and war, there's also a smaller story of alliance, which I want to make sure that we don't uh, skip over without mentioning. The alliance between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany between 1939 and 1941, the time of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, is very important for how we think about Europe today. Or it's very important, to put it a different way, for how people in Moscow think about Europe today. Because the period of the alliance with Nazi Germany which shows what anti-fascism actually was. Anti-fascism didn't mean opposing actual fascists. Anti-fascism meant 
strengthening and protecting the Soviet state. The alliance with Hitler, in Stalin's mind, was a way of turning Europe against itself. The idea was, and Stalin was very explicit about this, if Germany and the Soviet Union are allied, then the Second World War will be a war between Germany and France and Britain. And the result of this will be the destruction of Western civilization, the destruction of Europe, the hastening of the contradictions of capitalism to their final collapse. So you see there's a very interesting model here between 1939 and 1941. The model is you say you're against fascism, you make an alliance with the actual fascists, and you try to destroy Europe. We'll get back around to that. Okay. Now, from here, we're now at, we're now at the midpoint. From here, we move into a very interesting stage, which begins, um, uh, well, still before you were born. You're awfully young. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm now going to tell you something which, like, which you will laugh at, um, uh, and because everyone in the world thinks this is funny. The crucial decade and the really interesting decade is the 1970s, right? Okay, you didn't laugh, that's nice. It's very respectful, okay, all right. All right. Um, the, the 1970s are, I think, the axial decade. They're the crucial moment that brings us to where we are today. Because in the 1970s, you begin to see a competition between two ideas of integration. Um, a competition which is still going on, but um, which has to do with, in the end, where Ukraine actually is. In the 1970s in the Soviet Union, there is no longer the hope that Ukrainians will become Soviets and the Soviet Union will be a utopia, right? But there is the idea that Ukrainians will become Soviets. And there is the Brezhnev project of making sure that the Soviet Union just has one humanist intellectual, one humanist intelligentsia, one technical intelligentsia, and that these intelligentsias speak Russian, right? Um, there is the, the, the shift away from the Ukrainian language in elementary schools, high schools, and universities in this country. That is one project of integration. And then, on the other side, there is a European project of integration, which by the 1970s has been going on for a couple of decades, which by the 1970s receives a lot of attention in the Soviet empire and a bit of attention in Ukraine itself. There is a European project which leads indirectly to the Helsinki Final Act of 1975, of which the European states, Canada, the United States, and the Soviet Union are all signata signatories. 1975 and the Helsinki Final Act is a symbolic moment in politics because here, as elsewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, people seize on to the idea of human rights, an eminently European, also of course American, um, idea. But less well known is, is what the 1970s mean for uh, Ukrainians and, and, and Poles. And in particular, for, for a particular conversation in which, for the first time really in decades, and arguably in centuries, I would say probably centuries, for some Ukrainians, Poland starts to seem like Europe, and Europe starts to seem like a positive thing at the same time, right? Those are two very important developments. And they, and, and they begin with a conversation in the 1970s in which some people here I see took part, um, centered around the journal Kultura, in which Poles said, we are interested in a future independent Ukraine in its existing borders, right? That is, okay, we're fine, you know, no, we're not going to claim Lvov. Um, while many Ukrainian intellectuals were moving towards a civic understanding of Ukrainian patriotism, which made it easier for them to talk about Poland. To make a long story short, this meant that in 1989, something very important, a very important success could happen. Polish foreign policy in 1989, when Poland was sovereign, but Ukraine was not yet sovereign, could openly declare, we are following a policy of European standards. European standards mean we recognize your boundaries. We recognize your Western boundary. We recognize your Western boundary even though you don't exist yet, right? Because Ukraine did not yet exist. We preemptively recognize your Western boundary, right? Many preemptive things are bad. 
preemptively recognizing someone's boundary is probably good. Um, and this, this reference to Europe was actually true because an essential part of the European project is that boundaries are not challenged, right? The boundaries of states are taken for what they are. It's assumed that you can then have movement across those boundaries and you can create something meaningful in that way. So in, in, in this way, um, something, something begins to shift. Um, another, a, a positive idea of Europe in which Poland could play a positive role because that's very important, right? If, if, if Poland is negative, it's very hard to code Europe as positive. Um, anyway, that new idea begins to, take, begins to take shape. Now, I'm going to pass over the history of the last couple of decades in Ukraine because you know, it, you know it better than I do. The history of foreign policy that shifts from east to west, east to west, east to west. The history of domestic policy, which is an alternation among various oligarchical clans. The way that this ends, um, I think, decisively in 2013 and 2014 with, with the Maidan. What I want to emphasize instead is the way that another project has now, in fact, emerged. So, as of the early 21st century, the European Union seems to be the only game in town. And it is very attractive. It's attractive to um, a whole group of East European states who join, a whole group of East European states who don't actually imagine themselves um, without, without Europe. It's a very striking thing that the sh it, it, as soon as sovereignty was gained, the, the immediate step was to try to compromise that, that sovereignty. But over the course of the early 21st century, it could seem that this was the only integration project, right? The old Soviet integration project was gone. The Soviet Union was gone. The, the European project was moving onwards. In the 1990s and the early 21st century, Europe arguably presented um, I now feel guilty in front of my American compatriots, but Europe arguably presented the most impressive um, common market, the most impressive collective, if you like, welfare state that, has, that had ever existed. And Europeans had a certain tendency to believe that this was it. This was the only model and everyone likes us. Now, what's happened in the last year, and here I'm moving towards my conclusion, What's happened in the last year is that something has fundamentally changed. There is now a rival to this project. Um, the rival is not a Soviet rival, and it's not exactly a Russian rival, although it comes from the, Fed the Russian Federation. The rival is this Eurasian project. And what's special about Eurasia I mean, both as an ideology, in, 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 in the words of, of, of Dugin, or as a, as a policy, you know, in the hands of Putin. What's special about Eurasia is that for the very first time, someone, I mean, aside from some of my more radical Republican friends back home, um, someone is treating the European Union as an enemy, right? Someone is treating the European Union as something which is evil and is to be destroyed. Someone is mounting a cultural, ideological, and political attack on the European Union as such. Now, I, I, I am, I'm not telling you the history that you already know of the Maidan. You are here. What I'm trying to stress is that this counter-project revealed itself during the Maidan, right? I mean, for those of us who are watching from afar, um, who were spending the day paying attention to the Maidan and the, the night watching Russian television. It was, very, it was very clear that something had changed fundamentally in, in Russian propaganda. We've all noticed this too. Um, that the Maidan was being treated as aggression from the European Union. Not just the Americans. I mean, of course it's our fault. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no let's take that for granted, right? Um, but, but for the first time, um, something was being presented as aggression from the European Union. And that aggression was coded in certain ways as decadent, to use the, to use the dominant word, right? Where decadent means all kinds of toleration of things that I would regard as essential human freedoms. How you would like to live and with whom and in what way, essential civil rights.
So the European Union is being coded not only as an enemy, but, but as decadent. And this is new, and the Maidan brought, the Maidan brought this out because the trend of presenting, you know, this whole trend of presenting, you know, um, you know Yevropa as Gevropa, which was already there, it's not, it's, it's, it sounds funny, but it's actually not funny, which was already there in Russia, came much more to the fore because the Maidan was then described to the rest of the world in this way, as part of this offensive of this evil and decadent European Union. Now, this has led to a very interesting um, sort of dichotomy in the way that Russia is presenting the world, Russia is presenting Ukraine to the rest of the world. Because to us in the West, as I'm sure you're aware, what the Russian propaganda says is the Ukrainians are bad Europeans because they're fascists, right? Meanwhile, um, although that exists in Russia too, but meanwhile, within Russia, the problem is that Ukrainians are too good Europeans, right? You're too much like Europeans. That's the problem. You're different. You're like Europeans. So there's this basic contradiction in, in, the, in the Russian propaganda, it's a logical contradiction. And of course, it's bound to a political contradiction because the Eurasian project finds and seeks allies across the European far right. And this is now no longer a secret. I mean, the, the members of the European far right parties in France, as we see, in Austria, the smaller parties across Europe, Hungary, Greece, you name it, they have all been recruited and they have all essentially publicly pledged allegiance to the Putinist project. Right? So there is now a kind of fashion turn. I mean, there is now an international cooperative movement of far-right parties, uh, which is basically centered in Moscow. At the same time, everyone is supposed to criticize Ukraine because Ukraine is too far to the right. So, I mean, all of the Ukra European far right is for Russia, and yet we're all supposed to not like Ukraine because it's on the far right. So there's a, there's a, there's a contradiction here, um, which I think it's, going, it's taken us a while to see, but which is very clear. Now, no one in Moscow cares about these contradictions because they, they assume that we in the West are simply too slow and stupid to pick them up. And um, unfortunately, they're mostly right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We are very slow, and we have to be slow because we're pluralists. You know, we take arguments seriously. We think there's a kind of, every argument belongs to a constituency. We have to balance it all out on the one hand, on the other hand, and so on. And that's, un honestly, that's what's good about us. Um, we can't be so quick because we think that there are different kinds of arguments we have to, but it, this is actually not a difficult one to think through, and I'm, I'm confident that we'll think it through pretty quickly. Um, but the contradictions don't matter. You know, they're, in, in, in Moscow, they're perfectly aware that these are contradictions. They just don't care. What matters is that this is a coherent project. It's not at all crazy or irrational. It's not the kind of thing that if you point out the contradictions, it then goes away. It's a coherent project, the aim of which is to bring down the European Union um, and replace it with an alternative European project which is where I want to conclude with this, with this idea of European futures, where, of course, the European futures have everything to do with the past, everything to do with the past as it happened, everything to do with the past as we remember it, as we constantly remember it. Um, th there are multiple European futures now. Um, there's one European future which is not possible. That is the European future of the return to the nation state. And this is true here, just as it's true in, in the European Union. Um, in different ways, Ukraine and European Union member states have faced the same situation. You know, or at least all sensible people in Ukraine know, that a strong Ukrainian state it will exist insofar as it is integrated with other meaningful and hopefully well-meaning entities in the world. This is true in Ukraine, just like it's true in Belgium or Austria or Italy. None of those places are tenable by themselves. Um, this is why the position is the same in the European Union. In the European Union, you know, in, in the elections for parliament, which are going on right now, big important parties are campaigning on the platform of going back to the nation state. 
which is a foolish utopia, a foolish self-destructive utopia. Anyone who knows anything about Europe in the 1920s and 1930s, leaving aside the Second World War, but just the 1920s and 1930s, knows how nasty that was, how painful that was, how utterly and qualitatively different that was from the 1950s and the 1960s or, or today. But that is the utopia, you know, of going back to the nation state. That future is not possible. That is a utopia. That, that can't happen. What can happen um, is, is, is Eurasia. That, that, that idea of returning to the nation state or of a nation state being by itself, and whether that nation state is Austria or Ukraine, um, leads, so to speak, inevitably to Eurasia. Because the Eurasian project is precisely to make Europe, the whole of it, look like Ukraine does now. That is, um, alone, without enough friends who understand it, fragmented, intervened in from the outside. That's the idea. Um, you, what, what Russian policy towards Ukraine is now, it, it, of course it is directly Ukrainian policy. I don't mean to diminish that. I don't mean to diminish your very special situation. But it is also a test case for the European Union as a whole. Um, and in this way, Ukraine and Europe are now bound together, I think much more than Europeans or even Ukrainians have, have quite understood. There is a Eurasian future, which you can all go into together. And there is a European future, a European Union future that you can all go into together. There isn't anything else. That's what you have in common, right? Um, oh, well. I didn't have applause written here. <laughs> um, these are, I mean, they, I don't mean this politically. This is, this is just a logical, it's a logical deduction. Go, staying around as a nation state is as much a fantasy for you as it is for the Italians, right? Or for the, for the, for the Belgians. Their ha Europe will be together or Europe, or Europe will be Eur Eurasia. So um, in that case, now I really am coming to a close. Um, you When I say that Ukraine has a European history, I'm not trying to say that that's the only history that it has, right? If you, if, if just to compare it to the United States, you can say the United States has a British history, right? And that's, that's my preferred paradigm. I tend to think that the United States is, is, is really just a kind of extended right-wing deviation from, from British history. Um, but it also has a Spanish history and a French history and a Native American history. And without those things, the United States makes no sense. It has an African American history. Without the African American history, the United States makes no sense. So you can, make, you can say that Ukraine has a European history, and that would be true. It's also true that Ukraine has a Black Sea history, right? Ukraine has a history which has to do with its connection to the Ottoman Empire um, and to Islam. Um, Ukraine has a Slavic history, and of course Ukraine also has a history connected to, to Muscovy and the Russian Empire, which is where your question is going. But just as a matter of method, it's not exclusive, right? It's simply not exclusive. Um, Italy is the same way, or France is the same way. There is no one history, right? It's a mistake of national history to say there's only one line of history. There are always multiple lines, and those multiple lines mean that you do have choices about the future. If history was unitary, then we would all have no choice and life would be uninteresting. Um, the, the, the second thing I would say is that part of what one does as a historian is one tries to fill in the gaps, right? So one tries to correct where one thinks that mistakes are being made. So of course it's obviously true that there was a history of Muscovy, there was a history of the Russian Empire. In, in my country, um, as we tried to understand the Soviet Union in the second half of the 19th, in the second half of the 20th century, what we did was concentrate either as critics or supporters of the Soviet Union on that history of Muscovy, Russian Empire, Soviet Union. That was a very clear line for us. We read textbooks written by Ryazanovsky, which spelled that out for us very clearly, that there was this one line of history um, and Muscovy was the center. And so, in, in my own work, being aware of that, I have tried to stress that um, the trajectory of a lot of the territory that we're talking about, including the city where we're sitting now, 
doesn't jump directly from Kiev to Muscovy in some magical way, but also involves um, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So there are certain kinds of correctives, which are so to speak objective, right? That work, ag that work against some narrative that you, think, that you think is dominant. The final thing though that I would say is that as, <clears throat> as historians, we are definitely, we are not in a position to tell people in the present what they have to do. We can analyze, right? The, the anal my analysis was um, that Europe as an idea has figured in Ukraine in various ways, that it's figured as a kind of typical history that we can look at from a distance, that it's figured as um, uh, a, a mode of becoming national, which was typical in Ukraine in the 19th century, and that Ukraine figured in a very, Europe, the notion of Europe, figured in a very special way in the Soviet Union, an ambivalent way, which is now finally working itself out into a new ambivalence between, between the European Union and, and Russia. Um, it's perfectly legitimate to make historical arguments which stress the other side. That's perfectly legitimate. Um, what's, what's not legitimate is to deliberately leave big parts of history out, to deliberately leave big chunks of history out. So what I'm trying to do at the end of the day is to correct certain things and to point out certain challenges. If I were a big pro-European optimist, you know, what I would do is close the talk by saying, yes, you know, Ukraine is Europe and all you have to do is watch European television and win the Eurovision Song Contest and it will, to take a touchy example, and it will all be fine, right? That's not my conclusion. I'm not telling you a story about how everything's going to be good. I'm telling you a story about how the nature of the European challenge has changed and where I think, where I think, it, is, where I think it is ultimately today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rosina Kulka. Thank you. Uh, so, my question is, uh, you seem to argue that uh, the Eurasian Union is the most formidable of the arrivals, or potential arrivals, that the European Union has a project past. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, wonder, uh, I wonder why you think it is so. Uh, why not uh, China? Mm -hmm. Why not the Arab world? Or why not the Tea Party in your country? Uh, why not something which uh, do not be satisfied with this uh, most enlightened uh, project, most um, human rights based project, why, most prosperous project? Uh, so why precisely the Eurasian Union? What is so special about it? Mm. Well, th there's, there's a difference between opposing values and an actual political threat, right? So it's, it's certainly true that the Communist Party of China espouses certain different values than the European Commission. And it's also true that, um, I mean, to a lesser extent, that the, the Republican Party of Mississippi es espouses different values than the European Commission. Although there's actually much more overlap there than people like to admit. Um, the, but that, what's important, I mean, what's special about, what I think is truly special is that Eurasia only exists as a challenge to the European Union. It's a win-loss gamble. It's a big gamble because Eurasia isn't something which exists in a stable form over time like the United States or China. It's a project. It's a gamble. It's a particular geopolitical gamble. And the gamble is, as of fall 2013, you know, I think as a result of Glazyov and his influence, as of the fall of 2013, Russia is no longer content with a pretty good relationship with Europe, right? Not a bad relationship with Europe and not a bad relationship with, you, with, with Ukraine, right? If you reel back to October of 2013, Russia's relations with the European Union and with Ukraine, with Yanukovych in power, were not bad. It was not a bad situation for Russia, especially economically. That is what has now been placed in the balance. Now, a gamble has been made, and the gamble is, if we weaken the European Union, we're going to end up better than we were in October of 2013. It, it, there's no stable point. There's no going back to the fall of 2013. Either the European Union 
Um, so now the European Union has basically two choices. It can't just stumble along, right? Either the European Union rallies, creates an energy policy and so on, and then Russia is much worse off, or um, the European Union fragments and Russia is much better off. So this is the difference, that it's an, actual, it's an actual political challenge, not just an ideological challenge, which it is too, but an actual political challenge. In two years from now, you know, we will see whether the European Union, I mean two weeks from now for that matter, but two years from now we'll see whether the European Union is more or less like Eurasia. I don't think China and, and, and the United States have entered into anything like that kind of dynamic challenge. On, on the political spectrum, I, I'm not sure how this is all going to end, but it certainly is going, it's going very strangely. I mean, one thing which has struck me, uh, I mean, as someone who regards himself as being very much on the left, one thing which has struck me is the way that the European and the American left have completely failed to understand the, the parts of the Ukrainian, recent Ukrainian experience, which they might have found sympathetic. So you know, Ukraine was governed by an authoritarian kleptocrat who, um, who is, looks like a parody of late capitalism under Marx, you know, in, in Marxist analysis, right? That one person is trying to control everything. I mean, not just an oligarchy, but you know, one oligarch is trying to control all the other oligarchs. It's, it's, it is really like a parody of Marx's description of capitalism. And yet nobody on the left saw it that way. I mean, maybe three people, you know, in, in the entire West described it in something like this. And that, I think, was very striking. It's also very striking um, that people didn't identify with some of the most basic aims of the Maidan as being liberating. You know, the idea of the rule of law, decency, possibility of upward mobility. These are sort of typical rule of law, social democratic, center left, if you like, aims. But almost nobody in the West processed them that way. And then there's a third failure, which is that almost nobody in the West is processing Russia as being right wing. Even though, I mean, in my, from my point, I mean, maybe I'm old fashioned, but from my point of view, um, these, you know, these various assaults on traditional human rights, as they've been defined over the last half century, constitutes um, a, a kind of extreme form of social conservatism. I mean, you know, but, and the, you know, the, the notion that states should, can invade other states, that, that nation, that one nation could decide another nation is not real, um, that, you know, the, the, that you define the world in terms of ethnicity instead of law, right, which is what this whole notion of, of, um, of Russians or Russian speakers abroad is all about. These are not conservative ideas. I mean, these are ideas which come straight out of the fascist 1930s. And yet, they're not perceived that way. They're not processed that way. So there have been, what I think, three fundamental intellectual failures by, by the Western left um, in, in, the last, you know, in the last few months. And now we're all fighting about it, but it's, I, I, it, it's not at all clear to me that the left, I mean, I think that this has, I think this has been a kind of, honestly, a colossal failure of the intellectual left in, in, in both, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and, and, it, it, and, and then it, and it raises the question of how it can be, how this, how this could have happened, you know, how the left, which is supposed to be cosmopolitan and universalist and identify with the sufferings of others and so on, could have so, could have in many cases, including many prominent cases, sided with the kleptocrats, the authoritarians, and the pseudo-fascists. I mean, I think that's a very important question, and, it's, and I think it's part of a crisis of the left, which if people were honest, we would just describe it in this way. I mean, I think it is part of a crisis. Of, of, of the left. I mean, it's, it's striking that so many of the people who are sympathetic to the Maidan are, are sort of liberals and, um, liberals and traditional conservatives or liberal conservatives um, in, the, in, in Germany or in the US. Uh, so uh, something is clearly going on. Um, I mean, at the, at the level of the politics of Eurasia, it's, it's very simple. At the level of the politics of, the, of Eurasia, the assignment of the European and the American left is to criticize the Ukrainian right, not the Russian right, right? You're never, I mean, the next time that you see Die Lenke, that's the, the German left-wing party, which is not at all left-wing at all, um, the next time you see Die Lenke criticize the Russian right, you know, let me know, because it doesn't happen. Their assignment is to criticize the Ukrainian right. They don't even criticize the French right, or, you know, just 
the Ukrainian right. So clearly there is some kind of weird political program in which the only right wing which is supposed to be opposed is the Ukrainian right wing, whereas the much more powerful and actually you know, historically significant right wing movement, which is the Eurasian movement in Russia, goes unexamined, uncriticized, unnoticed, is just treated as, as, as reality. So there is, I mean, I think, Philip, you're right, I think something is going on which challenges, um, which challenges left and right. And I think it's, it, it, there, there are going to have to be a few more courageous people on the left who stand up and say, we completely bungled this one. You know, we got this one completely wrong. And it has to happen soon. Um, or else, you know, discussion is going to be, discussion is going to be impossible. Because you, the discussion of Russia and Ukraine can't be left to the, it can't be left to the, to the right. I mean, the right has its problems, you know. And the, the, the American right has its problems, which I won't go into because that's a completely different subject. Um, but it has its problems with, with, with Ukraine and Russia. You know, the, the American left and the, Ukra and, the, and the European left have to engage on this issue, sympathizing with people who want justice, sympathizing with people who want the rule of law and so on, um, as, you know, as, which is in large measure what the Maidan was all about. So I'm afraid that you're right. I mean, I'm afraid that um, the Maidan, just as it revealed um, what, the, what, the, what the Eurasian project was like. It also revealed certain you know, half-hidden crises in, in European and American political thought, which have now you know, come, come right out into the open, and I think which have to be aired. Uh, and that's just, it's one more way, I think, that the Ukrainian crisis is a European crisis. It's, a, it's been a crisis of European political thought, unfortunately. European political thought, with the exception of a few people in the German dailies, um, European political thought has failed, has failed to handle this. Um, it's not been impressive. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Ukraine is the European present. We've now reached a point where Ukrainian history and European history are very much the same thing, for good, for good or, or for evil. The European Union is no longer alone in the world. The European Union can no longer delude itself that it has no enemies. Um, the European Union can lose control of its own references, as is going on in this, in this information war about the Second World War. The European Union no longer controls the history of the Second World War. Right? German elites are losing control of the history of the Second World War, as we watch. So Europe is losing control of its history, it's losing control of its references. The information war, which is so sharp here, is taking place across the entirety of, of the West. Um, and it's working better in Germany, by the way, than it's, than, it's working, than it's working here. So an entire European order, the entire European order, is under challenge, just as Ukraine is under challenge. Not as immediately, not as sharply, not as painfully, but it is now one challenge. And in that sense, European futures depend upon Ukrainian futures, just as Ukrainian futures depend upon European futures. Thank you very much. The more boku ya ya hochu tuje vislovete vdiachnis dat zat se za za uvahu i za za vse što ja vid vas vid ukrainciv naukovciv studentiv sem sam naučevsi ja diaku. Thank you.